Uh, okay, I'm Professor O'Donnell. I'm the third instructor in this class. And uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, logic. Uh, actually, first a quick comment about the puzzle hunt, uh, which is due at the end of the today. Uh, thanks for participating. It's going well. I think it was a little longer and a little harder this time than in previous years. So kudos to you for hanging in there. Uh, I just want to remind you that I think almost all groups are almost done, and I think in this status, your minimum grade will be like 85 or 90, which is well above the typical homework average uh, <laughs> in this class. So, although, uh, yeah, just uh, don't stress too much about uh, this puzzle hunt if you can help it. And uh, all the future homeworks will be back to normal, which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, okay. So today we'll talk about uh, logic, which is a basic topic in, in math and computer science. Uh, you know, true and false, bits, zeros and ones, uh, and or not, lots of things that come up in your daily computer science life. Good. Um, so it's a bit funny because, you know, uh, you know, you employ logic when you're doing math problems. But we're also going to study the topic called logic. So don't be you know, freaked out about the fact that we're going to use logic and math to study logic. You should really think of logic as just like you know, another little area of math, like group graph theory or probability or what have you. And you can even think of it as like, you know, just a formal game that you play with symbols that turns out to have like, you know, practical relevance towards modeling mathematics. In fact, actually, you could give a similar definition for all of mathematics. It's just like a formal game that's played with symbols that turns out to be really good for modeling the real world. Uh, and we'll kind of see that perspective later in the class, but in the, the course of 251, but we're going to just focus on this sub-area of logic for today. Okay, so there are two areas of logic that we're going to talk about today. One is like a subset of the other, and the first one is uh, called propositional logic, or zeroth order logic, and it's sort of uh, the warm-up for the full version of logic, which is called first order logic. And uh, propositional logic is a model for a simple subset of mathematical reasoning. Okay, it's not, it doesn't capture all of mathematical reasoning, but it captures some of it. And it's basically that familiar thing I think you've all kind of seen before. It's the stuff with like, not, and, or, implies, and if and only if, okay, which correspond to these symbols, okay, and true and false. Um, so probably you've seen something about like this before, but we'll go through it anyway and warm ourselves up to propositional logic. Okay, so the basic component of propositional logic are statements, and you know, when we're modeling math with, uh, we're modeling the real world with math, we start with, you know, real stuff that we express in a natural language like English, like, Basic statements like potassium is observed or it's raining, okay? And in propositional logic, we formalize this by giving uh, what's called a propositional variable to stand for each of these sentences, okay? And a variable will always be denoted by like a lowercase letter, possibly with a subscript, okay? So we might just decide we're going to call this sentence about potassium K and this one about hydrogen H and this one about rain R. Okay, so those are basic sentences, which we capture by propositional variables. These are sentences that can be either true or false. And the next step is to model compound sentences, okay? And those will look like example, uh, for example, this sort of thing. Potassium is not observed. So this we would model if we're sticking with these propositional variables by not k, okay? Which in symbols is this not sign followed by k. Okay, or uh, this compound sentence, at least one of hydrogen and potassium is observed. Can somebody tell me how we would model uh, this with symbols? Yes. K or H, that's right. Or H or K, those are actually the same thing as we'll see eventually. Um, if potassium observed, then hydrogen is also observed. Can somebody tell me the symbols for this? Yeah, or K, I guess, if K is potassium, K uh, implies H. Um, okay, and here's like a slightly longer one that's relevant given that, you know, the Australian Open is on right now. If I'm not playing tennis, then I'm watching tennis, and if I'm not watching tennis, then I'm reading about tennis, so assuming I use like P, W, and R for that, I'd model that by not P implies W, and not W implies R. Okay, so this is how, you know, you go from like the wishy-washy real world of English sentences to propositional formulas, which are actual mathematical objects that we'll be able to reason about. 
OK, so let's talk a little bit more formally about what these uh, propositional formulas are. So formally, they're just strings made up of a bunch of symbols. And here are the symbols. There are parentheses, which are uh, punctuation. There's these five symbols for not, and, or, implies, and if and only if. And there's the variable symbols, which are usually lowercase letters, maybe with subscripts. Uh, but of course, it's not just any old string uh, is a, well, I guess any old string could be a formula, but we have a notion of what's a well-formed formula. And this just means like a string which is syntactically legitimate. So first I will tell you what this is by example. I think you'll get the, the picture, and then I'll show you how you could give a very formal definition using induction. OK, so uh, I'll just give you some examples of well-formed formulas. There's ones that look like they correspond to the, the rules of how we would make up uh, strings using and, or, and not, and so forth. So x1 is one, or this is like x1 and x3 implies not x2, or x1, and so forth. OK, here are some examples of non-well-formed formulas. This one just runs out of gas. Uh, this one is just crazy. It doesn't correspond to anything. This one looks good for a while, but you notice there's no symbol in here. There should be some kind of connective symbol in there. OK, so I hope you've seen stuff uh, somewhat like this before. But if you haven't, here's how you could formally define what it means for a string over these symbols to be a well-formed formula. It would have uh, an, induction, an inductive definition, which starts with a, a base case, some very simple kinds of well-formed formulas. And then there's rules by which you can derive new well-formed formulas from old ones. OK, so the base case here is that any single variable, just a single propositional variable, is a well-formed formula by definition. And then here are the rules. If you have some well-formed formula A already, you can either you can stick a not sign before it. Or if you have two things that you already know are well-formed formulas, you can uh, stick one of these symbols and or implies, or if and only if between them, and put parentheses around it. OK, and these are all the rules by which you define what set of strings are well-formed formulas. Any questions so far? You should always feel free to just you know, stop me by putting up your hand or whatever. OK, so that's uh, the, sort of the syntactic definition of what propositional formulas are. Um, let's talk now about truth, truth and falsity. OK, let's take this English sentence. If potassium is observed, then carbon and hydrogen are also observed. So how would we uh, convert this into a propositional formula? Somebody over here? Yeah. Yeah, K implies C and H. Great. Uh, so let me ask you a question. Is this statement true? I got one no. OK, actually, I'll give you the choices. The choices are yes, no, and it's a trick question. OK, I'm getting a lot of votes for trick question. Uh, yes, this question does not make sense, OK? So far, you cannot ask if a formula is true. That does not make sense. Uh, because, you know, intuitively, whether or not it's true depends on the state of the world. Like, it depends on if, whatever, carbon actually was observed, for example. OK, more specifically, we, in order to evaluate whether this compound formula is true, we need to know whether the individual propositional variables in this case, K, C, and H are true or false. So let's do some examples. Um, assuming you know exactly what these symbols mean, I think you should be able to answer these examples. If not, I'll, again, give you the formal definitions in a second. Uh, or you can just go by your intuition. Let's say if K is true, and C is true, and H is false, then what would we say about the truth of this whole sentence? Uh, everybody thinks it's false. Good. Yeah, it's false, because potassium apparently was observed, but it wasn't the case that both of these guys were. And uh, what about if potassium is not observed, and uh, C is false, and H is true? OK, great. Everybody knows it. There's some sort of subtle thing here. So here, it's not the case that this C and H is true. So we kind of have false implies false. Whether or not you feel like in real life or in English that should evaluate to true, we just take it as the rules in math that, that in math, uh, false implies something is always true. It's sort of like if you're doing an experiment and this was the outcome, you would not have falsified your hypothesis. OK, so in general, if you're trying to reason about a first order or propositional logic like this, um, you have a notion of a truth assignment, which I've written as this V. 
And it just assigns true or false to each variable. So that corresponds to like saying exactly for each of the statements whether it's true or false in the world. And once you've done that, then you can have a truth of value for any sentence that uses those variables. OK, and it, you can evaluate it formally in, in an inductive way, but it, it goes basically by this table. So I mean, if you have A and B, here are the rules for all of the five connectives. Not, and, or implies if and only if. So not A is just the opposite of A. A and B is true if and only if both A and B are true. Uh, a implies B is always true unless A is true but B is false. And this one is true, A if and only if B, if they have the same truth value. Okay, so hopefully the intuition for this table will come to you from the names of the symbols and or implies not an if and only if. Um, otherwise you can just take this table as the definition if you want. OK, so let's uh, just go through one more example to make sure it's clear. Let's say this is your sentence. Now I switch to having just variables with that are like all x's with subscripts. <coughs> That's the same basic format, though. x1 implies x2 and x3. So here's a truth assignment. It sets x1 to true, x2 to true, and x3 to false. And so to get the truth value under this assignment of the whole sentence, you basically just plug it in and reduce using the previous table. OK, so you plug in the values. You get true implies true and false. Then you say, OK, true and false, that evaluates to false. And now you have true implies false, and that also evaluates to false according to the previous table. So the, whole val the value of the whole sentence is false. OK. So great. So now we have a concept of uh, truth and falsity for our variables, which corresponds to truth and falsity for whole sentences, or well-formed formulas. And now I want to talk about uh, an important concept in computer science, satisfiability. So this slide is actually just a bunch of definitions, but hopefully they'll be intuitive to you. OK, so definition number one, if you have a well-formed formula S and a truth assignment V, we say that V satisfies the, uh, the sentence if it makes it true. And we say S is satisfiable if there is some truth valuation, V, under which it's true. So it's possible to set the variables in some way so that the whole sentence is true. Uh, S is unsatisfiable is just the opposite. OK, can somebody tell me what that would be? Right, uh, just the negation of this. There doesn't exist a V that makes S true, or put it conversely, uh, v of s is false for every truth assignment, v. OK, those are pretty clear based on the name. And if you ever uh, read some basic logic, you could guess this last one, which has a funny name. We say s is a tautology if it's true for every truth assignment. OK, so we have, uh, here we have three categories for a given propositional statement. It's uh, satisfiable, unsatisfiable, and tautology. So, Every well-formed formula that you can make can be put into one of these categories, and they sort of nest like this. Everything is either satisfiable or unsatisfiable. And if it's satisfiable, it may or may not also be a tautology, OK? This is, it's possible to make it true, and this is, it's always true no matter what you do. OK, so I'll do some examples. Here's a sentence, potassium is observed and potassium is not observed. That's K and not K. And that's unsatisfiable. It doesn't matter whether you set k to be true or false, that's always going to be false. OK, this is the one that we've seen before. Uh, potassium implies carbon and hydrogen. And as we saw before on that slide with two possibilities, there is, uh, there is a truth valuation for all these things, which makes this sentence true. But it's not a tautology because it's also possible to make it false. Okay. And as an example, tautology, if hydrogen is observed, then hydrogen is observed. Sounds pretty tautological, right? As a formula, it's H implies H. And regardless of whether or not H is true or false, this whole sentence is true. OK, any questions? Great. So as a reminder, a tautology is something that's sort of automatically true. You don't even need to know about the state of the world. It's true just for like purely logical reasons. And unsatisfiable is like the opposite. You don't even need to know the state of the world. The sentence is automatically false for purely logical reasons. 
And things that are satisfiable but not tautologies, it could go either way. The truth value actually could be true or false depending on the state of the world. Okay, so let's do a more tricky example. Here's a sentence S with uh, a lot of implies and some if and only ifs and ands. Now, uh, how can we decide if it falls into one of these categories, satisfiable or tautology or unsatisfiable? Well, we could sort of reason about it, but as you can see from this slide, uh, one surefire way you can like, understand everything there is to understand is to make a truth table. Okay, that's a very mechanical procedure that you've also possibly seen before. And to make a truth table for a sentence, it just means you take all the variables, in this case there are three, x, y, and z, and you just write out all possible ways they could be true or false. So you write down all possible truth assignments. Here are their eight. And then you just plug them all in and you find out what the sentence is. Okay, it's just the brute force way to check uh, truth or falsity of the sentence for every possible truth assignment. Okay, so for example, let's do the first row, false, false, false. Um, well, this one is true. You see, false, doesn't really matter what this is. False implies something is always true. This is also false, so this is, whole thing is going to be true. You'll have true if and only if true. Okay, that was, I said it in some bogus words there, but I assure you if you plug it all in, you'll get uh, true. So what can we conclude already at this point about S? Satisfiable. satisfiable, right, good. There's at least one satisfying truth assignment. Great. So then there's seven more to go. It's like a little bit laborious, but you could plug it all in, and if you did, you'd actually find that all of them are true. Okay, that's possible. And so we conclude that this guy is in fact a tautology, right. And you may be able to sort of reason about that intuitively in your head. It's like saying that if x, well, I was going to take a shot at this, but it's slightly tricky. If like, this is saying that whenever x and y are true, z is also true, and somehow this is saying the exact same thing, I guess. Anyway, that's why I said, you know, the truth table is good. It's a brute force method. You don't have to, like, reason too carefully. You can just write it all out and see what happens. Yeah? Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So the suggestion was like an alternate way to sort of simplify this and see that it's always true. We're going to talk about how to do that also shortly. Okay, so, uh, you know, using a truth table, you can always decide if it's satisfiable or if it's a tautology. And this truth table method has its pros and cons for reasoning about propositional formulas. So one pro is, as I said, it always works. You can just always do it, no problem. Uh, good. Can anybody suggest a con of the uh, analyzing thing with truth tables? How about somebody in the back half of the class? Here's all like this. Yes? What if you have like eight variables and you have Yeah, suppose you have eight variables, actually, then how many rows will be in your truth table? Yeah, or if you have n variables, how many will be in your truth table? Two to the n, yeah, there's two to the n possible truth valuations. And that's a drag. Eight that's pretty much the limit of what you could possibly conceive of writing out by hand without going bananas. Uh, so that's a con. Sort of, you know, to construct this truth table, roughly speaking, takes you like two to the n work. That's a, sort of a drag if n is even moderately big. Actually, here's a very famous conjecture. It says that if you're given a formula and you want to decide an algorithm that decides if it's satisfiable, any algorithm that always works uh, cannot work in polynomial time, so it cannot run in a number of steps like n squared, n cubed, n to the fourth. Uh, it's well believed that that's impossible. That's the famous p does not equal np problem, which you may or may not have heard of. And we'll talk about that much later in the course, and we'll actually talk more about what polynomial time means later in the course. So if you haven't seen these things before, it's okay. But this is just to keep you interested. And here's another interesting fact. In fact, most people conjecture that you cannot even have an algorithm that runs in time like 1.999 to the n that always, let's say, decides if a sentence is satisfiable or not. And sort of, most people kind of believe that in the worst case, if some your worst enemy gives you a formula, it might kind of take you like the full two to the n time to actually tell if it's true or false. So these are some open, uh, interesting open questions related to truth tables. Actually, when I was uh, making out these slides, I encountered another interesting open question about truth tables, which is this, who invented truth tables? So I was reading about it on Wikipedia, and Wikipedia blithely says that Wittgenstein invented truth tables. And I thought that was a little bit 
I was a little bit suspicious. Like, normally I love Wikipedia. It's like my go-to source to all things mathematical. But somehow that sounded a little fishy to me that, like, maybe like more of a hardcore mathematician. Well, they didn't have computer scientists back in his day, but uh, had invented them. So this is one candidate. So I looked into it a little bit more. I did my own research. And um, some others suggest that uh, Bertrand Russell, also more of a philosopher than a mathematician, invented them. He's also Wittgenstein's PhD advisor. Uh, other people suggested Emil Post. He uh, would be a computer scientist if they had computer science back then. This is all in like the 20s, or even the 10s. Uh, one paper was quite sure that the correct answer was uh, Peirce. Uh, Lukashevitz, another guy that would be a computer scientist if they had computers back then. These were all like candidates proposed. At this point, you might get the feeling that, well, whoever invented them is definitely some like older white guy. But <laughs> actually, even that's not true, because another strong candidate is Christine Ladd, who was Peirce's student. She has a paper about truth tables from like, I forget exactly, the very early 20th century. Also, arguably the first woman to get a PhD in math. Uh, she completed all the stuff, but like Johns Hopkins did not give it to her back in the day. They gave it to her like 40 years later, though, so sort of nice of them. <laughs> anyway, that's another open problem about uh, truth tables, which I guess we won't resolve today, but feel free to look into it and correct Wikipedia as you see fit. Okay, so uh, let's get back to the point that was made somewhere over here by this uh, gentleman on his phone uh, about an alternate way to decide if a a sentence is satisfiable or not, besides the truth table way. And that's to use the notion of logical equivalence. So here's the definition. We say that two formulas, S and T, are equivalent. And this is the symbol, S, triple line, T. If they have the same truth value for every truth assignment. So this kind of means that, although syntactically they might look different, they're really expressing the same concept. You know, regardless of the state of the world, S and T have the same truth value, so they're really the same thing even though they look different as formulas. OK, in other words, the truth tables are identical. So let's see some examples of this. There'll probably be some equivalences that are familiar to you. This one is sometimes called De Morgan's Law. So it says if you have not of x and y, that's the same thing as not x or not y. OK, it's like if, I, if it's not true that I have a nickel in my pocket and a penny in my pocket, then Either I don't have a nickel or I don't have a penny. That was a dumb example, but I'm improvising here. Uh, OK, so that's about variables. More generally, if A and B are actual whole sentences, not just propositional variables, this is also an equivalence. So now we have some other ones. Uh, A implies B. That's true. The only way that's not true is if A is false and B is true. OK, and that's the same as not A or B. So in fact, that kind of tells you if you have a sentence with some implies symbols in it, you can get rid of them and convert them to nots and ors. And A if and only if B is the same as A implies B and B implies A. You can also use that to get rid of these symbols if you don't like to have them in your formula. I don't know, double negation is trivial. A or B is the same as B or A. You can you know, check all of these by uh, looking at the truth tables. Uh, this says that or is commutative. It's also associative. So it doesn't matter where you put the parentheses. And so actually, in light of these last two, you see it's kind of OK like between you and me if we write just like A or B or C and are not like super finicky about where to put the parentheses, because these equivalences show you that it's all the same. Okay? It doesn't really change the truth concept. Okay, so now I henceforth grant you the right to like omit all the parentheses when you have big long ors. It's also true of ands, big long ands. Uh, a or A is the same as A. You get the, the gist. There's like lots and lots of these. OK, so everybody clear on the concept of equivalences? OK, so with this in hand, you have some kinds of alternate strategies. If I, you know, I ask you on the homework, please, I don't know, show that this thing is a tautology. Uh, so you could write down the truth table, and actually it's fairly easy because this one only has two variables, so it's four lines, but for illustration purposes, you can be clever about it using equivalences. OK, so you might first write down the formula. There it is. This is actually um, this is expressing a well-known, like, I don't know, basic deductive rule in philosophy. Does anybody know the name of this? Yeah, so it's called modus ponens. I don't know what it means in Latin, but it says if, uh, 
if x implies y and x is true, then y is true. Somebody know what it means in Latin? Something about a bridge, maybe? Method of bridges? Great. All right, yeah. It's less confusing when it's called modus ponens, I guess. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so one thing you could do is say, all right, let's take a look at this. Um, this whole structure of this thing, it's like a big blob implies y. So we could use this equivalence that converts a implies b into not a or b. Okay, so if you do that uh, and you squint, that converts this whole thing to a big or of y and the negation of this thing. And it turns this thing is that you're negating is an and, right? So there was that De Morgan law that like the not of an and gets converted to the or of nots. So you could sort of push this not in and say this thing is further in turn equivalent to this guy. And then the next equivalence I'll use is that uh, associativity of or, that it doesn't matter what order you or things in, so I'll just or together not x and y, and, and leave this guy by himself. Maybe I'll convert an implication to another or. And now at this point, you know, all of these things are equivalent. I've just been using these simple basic equivalences, so the original thing is equivalent to this guy. And now if you squint at this guy, it's sort of obvious that he, it's a tautology, because it's really, it's of the form not s or s, where s is this thing in parentheses. Okay, so if you just call that s, this line is really not s or s. And that's like obviously a tautology, right? Regardless of whether s is true or false, the or of s and not s is true. Okay, so, you know, this would be sort of an alternate way you could sort of mathematically reason that this thing is a tautology. Any questions? Great. Okay, uh, I wanted to talk about one more concept. And fortunately, you know, there's a lot of definitions. It's an early lecture in the course of the year, so maybe that's not surprising. One more definition in, first, in propositional logic, and then we'll move on to first order logic. And that's the notion of logical entailment. So, so far we spent some time talking about how you could decide is a statement S satisfiable or is it a tautology? And that's a medium interesting question as far as it goes. Um, but more likely if you're using sort of like logic to solve your, I don't know, like puzzle in a book or whatnot or reason about your scientific hypotheses, it's more likely you're going to be doing this slightly alternate thing. You're going to assume you have some axioms or some things that are some statements a1, A2, A3, AM, which are true, and you want to decide, is another statement, S, a logical consequence of them? Okay, if these are facts that you take as given, does it follow that S must be true? That's a more typical kind of thing to be interested in when using logic to help you reason. Okay, so uh, formally, we'll say that given some well-formed formulas, A1 through AM, they entail, that's the definition, another formula S, and that's the symbol right here, this double turnstile. If every truth assignment which makes all the axioms true also makes the conclusion true. Okay? So it's sort of like saying S is a necessary logical consequence of the axioms. If, no matter what the state of the world is, if all of these things are fulfilled, then the conclusion must also be fulfilled. Okay, it's something that you can logically deduce or derive from the statements A1 through AM. Okay, so let me, just like uh, equivalences, let me give some more examples there, just so it's uh, clear. Um, so X and Y, these are very simple sentences that just consist of a single variable, together entail X and Y. Okay, if X and Y are both true, then their and is both true. And similarly, the same thing is true if x and y are not just variables, but whole long sentences. <clears throat> okay, here's another example. If you know that a is true, then a or b must also be uh, true for any sentence b. Or this is maybe the more usual way you would think about modus ponens. If you know a is true, and you know that a implies b, then you know that b has to be true. Okay, and again, you can check all these things by, you know, writing down all the truth tables and verifying that whenever everything on the left is true, the thing on the right is true. Okay, A implies B and B implies C. 
From this, you can deduce A implies C. This is a well-known one called resolution. You can think about that. Okay, there's a bunch more like this. Uh, and although this is a new concept and it's an important one for, I don't know, the practice of logic, it's actually kind of in some ways the same or interreducible with tautologies. Can somebody make the connection between entailment and tautologies? Yeah. Exactly right. So uh, here's a little fact, uh, which is easy to see. A1 through AM entail S, if and only if this thing is a tautology. The and of all the axioms implies S. OK, and the proof is just that, by definition, this means for every truth assignment uh, that makes all the A's true, S is also true. And that's exactly by the meaning of implies and the ands what the second statement is saying. Every truth assignment, uh, which makes A1 through AM true, also makes S true. <clears throat> OK, so in some sense, if you understand tautologies, you understand entailment, and also vice versa, really. But it's, I think it's helpful to think of it as a bit of a separate concept. <clears throat> OK, so that's all I really wanted to say about propositional logic and or not implies. Any questions about it? Yeah. Yeah, the question was, is there any shorthand term or that's equivalent to exclusive or? Um, you can invent one if you want. Uh, we kind of already have one. This, I don't know if I can scroll all the way back to it. This if and only if. It's almost like uh, exclusive or. Uh, I shouldn't go all the way back. OK, if and, x if and only if y is true if and only if they have the same truth values. So xor is the negation of that. So xor is like the negation of x if and only if y. OK, and it's kind of like a weird historical convention that we decided on these five, you know, and, or, not, implies, and if and only if. You could have, it's actually an interesting question to think of uh, what other connectives you could have chosen, or can you get away with fewer connectives such that you can still express all concepts. But these five are a, a nice subset. Any more questions? OK, so propositional logic, I expect you to know it uh, cold by the end of, say, the next week, and there'll be uh, plenty of homework questions about it. Uh, the second concept, is the extension of it, is called first order logic. And I want you to at least get the gist of it. But I'm, we might not ask you very picky questions about it, because I don't want to be incredibly formal about defining everything. So uh, we'll start out pretty formal, but then it'll devolve into stories by the end of the lecture. OK, so first order logic is kind of the logic for all of mathematical reasoning, like you do whenever you're solving uh, homework problems or doing math research. And it starts out with the base of propositional logic. You're not and, or, et cetera. And it adds uh, the following things. It adds for all, which is this upside down A, and there exists, which is this backwards E, and equals. You all know what equals is. And it adds uh, three more concepts called constants, relations, and functions. OK, I'll say what those are uh, more clearly in a second. And an important thing to realize about propositional or first order logic, in propositional logic, you had variables. And they stood for things that were either true or false. They stood for truth values. In first order logic, though, no. Now variables stand for objects. I'll give you some examples. OK, here's a sentence that you could formulate with uh, first order logic. Alex is smarter than anyone, everyone. Is anybody here called Alex? Awesome, awesome. I picked the, just because it started with an A, which was important for this, and because it was like a relatively gender neutral name. But it's probably there would be an Alex in the class. OK, so uh, here's how you would formulate it, possibly, in first order logic. And I hope you'll get the gist of the rules of first order logic sentences by seeing these examples. So this says, for all x uh, is smarter A comma x. So let me go over the pieces here. Here, x is a variable. And as I said before, it stands for objects. Or at least in this example, it stands for people. The universe of discourse is people. OK, so variables and also constants stand for people. So in this uh, sentence, a stands for the constant object, 
Alex. Let's say there he is right there. And uh, there's one more ingredient here besides the for all. There's this thing. This is called a relation name, is smarter. And uh, a relation is a function that maps objects to true or false. That's what a relation is. Function from objects to either true or false. And I try to, I'm tending to write them with this prefix is. Okay? So this is a, a relation that takes two inputs and outputs either true or false. Okay, so this short thing in first order logic is the formalization of that English sentence. Now actually, in English, you probably, if you said this, you probably didn't mean exactly this. Can somebody say maybe why this is not exactly what you might have meant? Oh, I gave it away. Okay, I gave it away, yeah. Yeah, so here, more accurately, uh, you might have said Alex is smarter than everybody else. That's probably what you meant. And to formalize that takes a few more symbols. It would look like this. For all people, this is an implication. Uh, either x is different from Alex, oh sorry, if x is different from Alex, then x, uh, Alex is smarter than x. Okay? So this is saying that for any object or person that's not Alex, it holds that Alex is smarter than them. Okay, so I put this in uh, to emphasize a few more things. Here we have equality, and it's between objects. And all the basic stuff of propositional logic, like implies and not and 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 or, are part of first order logic. Okay, so this is like the, what we've been doing here is like the game we did at the beginning of taking English compound sentences and formalizing them in first order logic. Uh, so I'll do one more example. This uh, introduces the notion of functions, and I chose father because it starts with F, and everybody has a father, so it makes sense as a function concept. Uh, so to formalize, X, Alex's father is smarter than everyone else's father, we write it like this. So for all people, assuming they're not Alex, the father of Alex is smarter than the father of X. Okay, so a function is something that takes object, it's a function that maps objects to other objects. Okay, so relations map objects to true or false, functions map objects to other objects. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Uh, no. So a function is still a function. It's uh, one whose range and domain is the universe, which I'll talk to in a, about in a second. And you might think uh, normally of a relation as like sort of a subset of all um, pairs. So if you think of pairs of objects, maybe you, uh, your first definition of a relation is it's a subset of all pairs. But you can really think of that as a function from pairs to true or false. You know, the ones that are in the subset correspond to true, and the ones that are not in the subset correspond to false. So it's, it is the same concept. Yeah. Uh, let me just say no. So, I mean, we want to keep to the system where I'm not going to uh, give a full inductive definition of what is a formula in first order logic, but I really want to stick to the system where you just have these symbols for all is always quantified over everything. There exists is always quantified over everything. If you're like a super nerd, actually, you can drop having constants, because a constant is actually like a function with no domain. But we will not be that ridiculous. OK. OK, so uh, whenever you're doing first order logic, you always have a, what's called a vocabulary. And a vocabulary is a collection of constant names, function names, and relation names. So on the previous few slides, uh, I introduced one constant name, A, one function name, father, which takes one parameter, and one relation name, is smarter, which takes two parameters. And this is the language you use to make formulas. So the formulas are made up of, you know, propositional logic stuff, for all, exists, equals, and these names in your vocabulary. So let me give you another example of some vocabulary. Here's one with uh, one constant name A, two function names that I called next and combine for no especially good reason, and one relation name which I called is prior. 
And so if I say, OK, here are the vocab here's your vocabulary. What well-formed sentences do you have? I'm not going to give a formal definition, but it looks like stuff like this. So I don't know, this uh, last one says, for all x, you look at next of x and x, plug that into is prior. Is prior is a relation, so it gives you a truth or false value. Equality also sort of returns true or false, and then it sort of all resolves down to uh, a propositional logic statement. OK, but I think you'll kind of get the gist of what, uh, consists to, or what constitute well-formed formulas in first order logic. OK, so now we're going to do a bunch of stuff that parallels exactly what we did for propositional logic in this more advanced setting of first order logic. So let's talk about truth. OK, so here is a sentence in first order logic over the vocabulary I talked about before. There exists x such that next of x equals the combine of a and a. OK, so is this sentence true? Really? Uh, let's take a, let's take a, there's true, false, and trick question. Yes, that's again a trick question, sorry. Uh, it doesn't make sense because we, uh, whether or not it's true depends on our interpretation of the vocabulary. Okay? Here, interpretation is another technical term just like truth value, or truth assignment. Okay? Interpretation. So here's the definition of interpretation. And formally, it just says what the objects are and what the vocabulary means. Okay? It's like an assignment of meaning to all of the syntactic pieces. So precisely, an interpretation is kind of a complicated object. It specifies a non-empty set for what the objects are. That's called the universe. OK, so in our original example, the universe was like the set of all people. And it maps each constant name to a specific object in the universe, like the symbol A gets mapped to Alex, that guy. And it maps each, uh, let's say, function name to an actual function. So like father gets mapped to the function that actually takes a person and outputs the person's father. And same for relation names. And just as before, the truth or falsity of this sentence depends on what the interpretation is. So let me give you an example interpretation. Uh, so I need to specify the universe. So I'll say the universe is all strings of zeros and ones. And I need to say what the constant a is. So I'll say it's the string 1, 0, 0, 1. I'll say that next is the function that tacks a 0 on the end. Combine is the concatenation function. And is prior x, y is true if and only if x is a prefix of y. OK, so under this interpretation, is this sentence true or false? How about somebody? OK, how about you? False. Uh, that is correct. It's false. So let's see why it's false. Um, well, you just have to, oops, I should say in words. So. Uh, combine of a, a is the string 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. And this is sort of saying there exists a string such that if you tack a 0 on the end, you'll get 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Well, that's not true. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1 ends in a 0. So under this interpretation, this sentence is false. Does that make sense? But I could totally change what I mean. Uh, I use a totally different interpretation, which will potentially make it true. So I could say, ah, actually my interpretation is that the universe is integers. So every object is an integer. A means 0. Next of x means x plus 1. Combine of xy means x plus y. And is prior xy is true if x is less than y. So under this interpretation, is the sentence true or false? OK, who said, somebody over here said true. Why is it true? Right. Uh, the, his, uh, what he said was, if x is negative 1, then it's true. And you know, under this interpretation, OK, combine of a and a is 0 plus 0, that's 0. So this is like saying there is some number, some integer, which if you add 1 to it, you get 0. Well, that's true. Minus 1. OK, what if I change, this should say interpretation number 3, that's a bug. What if I change it so that uh, it's everything is the same, but the universe is the natural numbers? then it's false, right? There, in the natural numbers, there is no number which, if you add 1, you get 0. OK, so just as within propositional sentences that can be true or false, depending on how you assign truth values, in first order logic, a sentence can be true or false, depending on what the interpretation of all the symbols is. 
Okay, we have the same notion of satisfiability and tautology. So, given a sentence S, we say an interpretation satisfies it if it makes it true. We say S is satisfiable if there is some interpretation that makes S true. It's unsatisfiable otherwise. And we say S is a tautology if every interpretation makes it true. It's okay, you can stretch. Uh, okay, so as before, we can split up everything like this. So here's an example, unsatisfiable sentence. It says that there exists an x such that next of x does not equal next of x. And that's false no matter what the interpretation is. I mean, something always equals itself. So this one, it doesn't matter the interpretation, it's false. Satisfiable, here's an example. This is the one we saw before. Some interpretations made it true, some made it false. So it's satisfiable, but not a tautology. And an example of tautology is this one. It says, for all x, x equals a. If that's true, then next of a equals a. Can somebody tell me why this is true, no matter what the interpretation is? Why it's a tautology? Yeah. Uh, the suggestion was, al almost, the suggestion was that the, it's because the first part is false. And if that were so, then uh, the whole thing would be true, because false implies anything is true. You answered a lot. It's almost true that for every interpretation, the first part is false. But actually, sometimes it's true, the first part. When is it true? The only time it could be true is if A is the only element in the universe. It doesn't have to be around to that. Right. So this takes a little proof. Uh, one possibility is that this is false, in which case you're done. The other possibility is that the universe is of size 1. There's only one thing in it. But then this says that everything is equal to A. So in particular, next of A also equals A. Everything is the same. Okay, so that, as you see, took a little bit of reasoning, but it is a tautology. It's true under every interpretation. Okay, so again, tautology is something automatically true just for logical reasons. Unsatisfiable is automatically false just for logical reasons, and satisfiable is it could go either way. We have time for this example. Yeah. Okay, so here's another sentence. It looks more complicated. And I might say, problem one, show that this is satisfiable. Okay? And that's a typical uh, problem. It's quite easy. You just have to give some interpretation which makes the sentence true. And so often a lot of things will do. So I'm going to say, all right, the universe is integers, and I should define next of y, so I'll define it to be y plus 1. So I've defined, that's a full interpretation, I've defined everything, and let's see what it says. This piece says, there's some magic number y such that every x equals y plus 1. There's an integer y such that every integer equals y plus 1. Well, we're talking about the integers, that's just false, right? That's not, that's not true at all. So under this interpretation, this whole piece is false. And so we don't even actually have to finish evaluating this. It's also false, actually, but it doesn't matter. This whole thing will become true. Is that clear? OK, great. What about this? Is it a tautology? Yeah. Uh, the suggestion is that if you make the universe just one element, then what will happen? Is it true or false? You also technically would have to say what next means, but you don't have a lot of choice in defining a function if there's only one thing in the world. Well, uh, actually, you know, it's not totally shocking if it, you don't see right away whether it's a tautology, because it's a bit harder to decide tautologies in, in the world of first order logic because you have to reason about every possible interpretation. Actually, though, so there's no truth table method, okay? You know, you can't write down like every possible interpretation because you have to write down like every possible universe. There's infinitely many. You have to write down what everything could possibly mean. So that's out. That's a shame. So you have to use more cleverness. So actually, this one is a tautology. Do you want to say why? Or did you, was that what you were raising your hand for? It's, you're getting there. It's actually like what this person says. This is sort of similar to the other tautology we saw. 
but more, a bit more complicated. So here's a proof that this is a tautology. We need to show that every interpretation makes this sentence true. So I'll say, let i be any interpretation. Now I'm going to do two cases. Case one, the interpretation, whatever it is, makes this piece false, the first half. OK? Then I'm done, because you know false implies something is always true. So then the sentence is true. OK, so case one, where i makes the first half false, the sentence is definitely true. OK, what's left? It's when case two, when the interpretation makes the first part true. So let's think about what that means. If you read what it says, it says there exists some like magic y such that every x equals next of y. So that means every object in the universe next of that equals, sorry, equals next of y. So whatever next of y is, it's some object, everything equals it under this interpretation. So what does that say about, let's say, the size of the universe? Yeah, it would have to be one. I mean, if the interpretation of this is true, then everything equals to next of y. So there's only one thing. But in that case, if the universe has size one, then this piece is also true. This says, you know, in words, that all w's and z's are equal. And that's true if there's only one thing in the world. OK, so that, I mean, maybe you didn't get all of that in one shot. You can reflect on it uh, after class. But you see that we proved it was a tautology, but it took some mental effort. Any questions about that uh, proof? OK. This is about the point in the lecture where I was transitioning a little bit into story mode. There's one more definition that I definitely want you to learn coming up, but um, you know, I've said most of what I want to say formally about first order logic, and now I'm going to tell you some things that are interesting. OK, so it's kind of a shame that there's no truth table method. You know, in the propositional logic, in the worst case, you could just draw a big truth table. In the end of the day, you'd decide anything you want to know. Is it satisfiable? Is it a tautology? Whatever. Here, you seem stuck because there are like infinitely many interpretations. So it'd be really great if there was some kind of mechanical method that you could fall back on to you know, make these decisions, like, is this a tautology or not? OK, so one thing that you could do is a bit like what we saw with uh, checking equivalences. You know, you could try to reason, well, this piece of the formula is kind of equivalent to that, and this is equivalent to that. Maybe you could get some kind of mechanistic way to show that something is a tautology. And this is the, something that logicians were thinking about, like in the early 20th century. These are two gentlemen that thought about it a lot, Frege and uh, Hilbert. And they had an idea, which is actually kind of familiar to most people these days, the notion of a deductive calculus. And what that means is it's like a fixed set of like mechanical rules, like symbolic rules, whereby you can deduce new tautologies from known tautologies. So if you have some things that you've proven are tautologies, you do some mechanical rules, and you can pop out something else, which is also definitely a tautology. Uh, so here's a very simple such rule. If like, you know A is a tautology, it's always true no matter what the interpretation is. And A implies B is also a tautology, it's always true no matter what the interpretation is. Then B must also be a tautology. It's also got to be true no matter what the interpretation is. OK, so without getting into too many details, or really any details, if you crack open like any textbook on logic, Basically, like around page one, it'll like give you uh, all the rules of some deductive calculus. You know, it'll change a little bit from book to book, but basically it'll have the same kinds of rules. And I will not say those rules because it takes a while, but it's basic stuff like this. First they say, you know, uh, if A is any sentence at all, then A or not A is a tautology. And, you know, that's true. So that's good. That gives you some basic tautologies. In fact, if you take any tautology in propositional logic, which you can decide by the truth table method. You can stick in sentences for its variables, and that's also a tautology in first order logic. And, you know, like page one will have some rules like, I don't know, these, like this one says, this is a tautology. Um, if is R, you know, some relation is true of A, then you can deduce that there exists something such that is R. Okay, I'll have like a long bunch of syntactical rules, all of which are like obviously tautological sentences. 
And it'll give you a deduction rule that says, well, in fact, just this one we saw before, modus ponens. If you sort of generated the tautology A and you've generated the tautology A implies B, then you can further generate the tautology B. Okay, so this deductive calculus says, you know, syntactic way, here are like a bunch of trivially tautological statements, and here's how you can make new ones. So you can just go around and use these rules, whatever your vocabulary is, to generate a bunch of tautologies. Now, unless your logic textbook has made a mistake, which hopefully it hasn't, it's easy to see that anything you deduce in this way really is a tautology, okay? Because everything you start with really is a tautology, and this is like a valid rule. So that's great. You can, you know, deduce a lot of tautologies. But you might ask, okay, if my vocabulary is, you know, this one we were talking about before, can I get to this guy, starting from the basic rules and doing more deductions? It's not clear that, you know, the rules will be enough in your logic textbook to get you there. Okay, so this question was thought about by a gentleman called uh, Kurt Gödel when he was a PhD student. And he proved an awesome theorem, and it was his PhD thesis. Uh, the answer to this question is yes. So he proved, and this is very, I'm not going to show you this proof, it's very long and hard. Uh, he proved that Actually, if you take, like, whatever, one of these deductive calculus, calculi, then you can actually deduce every single tautology just by syntactically implying the deductive calculus rules. Okay, this is, uh, I've heard some people say that this is his best theorem. It's called Gödel's completeness theorem. Uh, well, he has some other theorems we'll talk about later in the course, but this is a great one for today. So the good thing about this theorem of his, which we'll take on faith, is that there is actually a purely mechanical, algorithmic way to verify that a given statement is a tautology. So there is kind of a truth table method in the sense that if you have any sentence and you want to show that it's a tautology, then you just uh, sort of brute force, like, do all possible syntactic deductions in this deductive calculus. And if it really is a tautology, Gödel's theorem will tell you that you'll eventually deduce it. Okay, any questions about that concept? It's not, you know, I didn't tell you all the details or anything, but I wanted to tell you about it. Yeah. Well, basically this uh, bag of rules that you have, it actually gives you infinitely many tautologies to start, because these are sort of more like recipes for tautologies. And so you have like a bunch to start with, and like it gives you rules, and if you, as long as you follow these purely syntactic rule, everything you get will only be a tautology. So then if you start throwing in like something that isn't a tautology and start applying the rules, then everything is haywire. What you get out probably will not be a tautology. Okay. Great. Uh, so I have one more definition that I actually want you to uh, know for sure, but I make it uh, because it's relevant and it'll allow me to also finish with some more enjoyable stories. Uh, so it's about a concept that we've seen before, and it's actually the exact same concept, logical entailment. So as before, we've been talking a lot about deciding if something is a tautology. That's a medium interests question. <coughs> uh, but again, if you're doing, you know, science or reasoning, it's more likely that you'll start with some axioms or statements that you're just saying, I axiomatically say that these are true, and you try to decide if S is a logical consequence of them. So the definition is just the same as before, except everything's in this more complicated world of first order logic. So we say the formulas a1 through am entail some other statement s, written like this, if every interpretation, not truth assignment, but interpretation which makes the axioms true, also makes the, the statement s true. Okay, in other words, s is a logical consequence of a1 through am. Whenever the axioms are true, s follows. And as we saw before, you can relate that to tautologies. These guys entail S if and only if this sentence is a tautology. So this is actually maybe the most typical use of first order logic in mathematics. You think of some universe you want to reason about, maybe high school geometry, or arithmetic and prime numbers, or what have you, uh, 
category theory. And you want to reason about it, and you want to model your reasoning, so you invent an appropriate vocabulary that's relevant. And you start with some axioms that are true under the interpretation you have in mind. So they're not tautologies, but they're you know, true things about, let's say, arithmetic. And then you start playing a game. You see what statements they entail. And you wonder if you can sort of use a small set of axioms to prove every you know, true fact about your world, let's say geometry. And what's nice is that by this Girdle's theorem, looking at everything the axioms entail is the same. It's exactly the same thing as everything that you can syntactically deduce using your logic textbook. OK, so this is like a, a game that actually people played a lot in the early 20th century. They took their favorite area, tried to model it with a very small number of axioms, and see if they, you know, they could actually prove everything logically from those axioms. So I'm going to give you some examples of that, and this is, now we're into the stories, you know, this will not be on the test, blah, 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 but I want to tell you a little bit about logic. Okay, so this actually, uh, this idea of like, you know, trying to take your fixed domain of reasoning and like start with a very basic number of axioms and tr prove everything super rigorously goes back a really long way. Can somebody tell me who's generally credited with this idea? Yeah? That's right. Euclid, and we name Euclidean geometry, which is like you know high school geometry in two dimensions after Euclid. So Euclid lived a indefinitely far ago. I don't know exactly, and he tried to prove everything about uh, geometry from five axioms. Okay, and here were his five axioms. So the first one is like to draw a straight line from any point to any point. It's not even a full sentence, as far as I know. Uh, to describe a circle with any center and radius. OK, so this all makes no sense. At least he tried, OK? <laughs> uh, even if you, ex it's not, OK, first order logic could not be invented. You cannot fault him. But actually, even if you accept, like, you know, he was trying his best, he just made a lot of mistakes. So, like, he assumed things that really did not follow from his axioms. For example, Euclid assumed that if you have a circle and you put a line, an infinite line that goes through his center, the center of the circle, he assumed that that line would touch the circle. Which is true, but it does not follow in any way from his five axioms. So, like, he just didn't think that, like, oh, he thought that was obvious, but it does not, you know, it's not actually entailed by these axioms. Well, if these axioms made sense. Okay, so much, much, much later, in like the 40s, maybe, or the 50s, there was a gentleman called Tarski, and he's like, I'm going to do this right. So, uh, he did. OK, so I'll actually tell you his axioms. He's like, I'm really going to give you first order logic. I got the vocabulary. And just as a warm up, the interpretation he had in mind, uh, the objects are points in the plane. OK, so he's like, constant names, I don't need them. Function names, I don't need them. Relation names, I'm going to have two. One is called is between, and it takes three points, is what he had in mind. And it's supposed to mean y is on the segment between x and z. And I have one more called is same length, and it says that x1 to x2, that distance is the same as the distance from y1 to y2. OK, and then he had some axioms. There were 11 of them. I'm not going to write them all. It's, there's no point, but they're basic stuff. So like this says that uh, x1, x2 has the same length as x2, x1. And this one says uh, if the distance from x to y is the same as the distance from z to z, then x equals y. And that is true if you're thinking about Euclidean space, right? It means this distance is zero. OK, and he wrote down like uh, 11 things that are all obviously true. Now, this doesn't actually mention points in space or anything. It's just purely syntactical. But it captures Euclidean geometry, it seems. And uh, furthermore, you know, these are all true facts. So anything that you could deduce from logically uh, or anything that these entail is actually a true statement about geometry. OK, so the question was, is there any way uh, you could prove that maybe this is the fewest axioms you need to capture all of geometry or prove every true statement about geometry? <clears throat> Actually, that's a good question, but we should back it up a little bit. Does this prove every true statement about geometry? You know, I just introduced a few axioms, and like maybe I forgot a couple, and like maybe 
you can't, you know, prove the really complicated, whatever, Chavis theorem or like the nine point circle or whatever your craziest theorem of two dimensional geometry is, maybe you cannot prove it using just these few axioms. Uh, and Tarski showed an amazing thing, and I would like to emphasize that this is kind of a freak case, Euclidean geometry, that he was able to show this. He showed that these 11 axioms are complete. I.e., every, you know, true statement about geometry in two dimensions, you can, is entailed by these axioms. So you can, uh, any interpretation that makes the axioms true, even if it's not really geometry, it still makes S true. Uh, or you could deduce S in the deductive calculus from these axioms. Oops. Um, and as I said, that's a bit of a, like an amazing case that he, it, in some ways it says Euclidean geometry is not that complicated because you can sort of completely capture it by these 11 axioms. And it is true that some people after this, you know, played the game, actually I think Tarski started with, I don't know, 17 axioms or something, and people did work on like, oh, you can actually eliminate this one, or you can make this new axiom that's a little more efficient and so forth. Um, it's a bit unclear. I mean, there's a trade-off. You know, maybe you could try to prove it. The question is, can you prove this is the fewest axioms? Maybe if you fix this vocabulary, you could also try to change the vocabulary too. So people don't work on it too much. They're, I think, mostly satisfied that this is true. But it's, it's still a, an interesting question. Okay, here's another domain, arithmetic of the natural numbers. So this was uh, attacked by this guy, Giuseppe Piano, also like the 1900s, first cent decade, I think. Uh, and he made a bunch of axioms that you may recall from uh, Professor Rusch's last lecture. Actually, he, he, the version I'm going to put up there is a bit more extensive than what was in the previous ones. So he said, my vocabulary is going to have one constant name, zero, and three function names, successor, plus, and times, and no relation names. And he had seven axioms that are all true about the natural numbers. Uh, like, no number is the successor of zero, or uh, x times zero is zero for all x. OK, and it's just syntactic, but these are all true facts about the naturals. Actually, this last one is not just one axiom. It's a family of axioms that implies in, uh, expresses induction. OK, and now you can ask the same question. You know, these things, these axioms are all true about, I mean, about the natural numbers. So anything that you can deduce or anything that's entailed by these axioms is true. You might ask, how good is this? Do we need some more axioms? Uh, does that cover everything? I mean, we're really just modeling math reasoning here. So we might not have done enough modeling. We might need more axioms. And as I said before, the case with Euclidean geometry is a bit freakish that you could prove a theorem about it. But, uh, here we have only an answer based on experience. And as Professor Rouge suggested last time, it seems pretty much that these axioms are more or less complete. So after 125 years of thinking about it, pretty much all true statements about arithmetic can be deduced from these axioms. Like, you know, even tough ones like the, the theorem that every number is the sum of four square, perfect squares, the prime number theorem, lots of complicated uh, theorems can all be deduced from these axioms. Um, on the other hand, we do know that it's not complete. There's uh, one or two tricky theorems that, you know, they're true, but uh, you can't deduce from them for the axioms. One is called Goodstein's theorem. You can look that up at some point. It's some statement about an algorithm for changing one number from base this to base that, and it says that eventually, if you keep applying this rule, you'll get all the way down to the number one. It's a theorem, but you we actually know you cannot deduce it from these axioms. But that's like one very like weird theorem, but you know, pretty much anything that you think of about natural numbers, we know you can prove from these axioms. Actually, there's one or uh, two other interesting examples of things that you can't prove from these axioms that we'll get back to in lecture 24. And uh, one other nice thing about these axioms is you can also prove a lot of things about the integers using these axioms. Um, because even though it doesn't talk about subtraction or negative numbers, you can still use these like pieces, like in a kind of a programming language way, to build up more advanced notions like negation or subtraction or finite lists and things. So that brings me to the last example that I wanted to mention. This is uh, set theory. 
It's another domain like geometry or uh, arithmetic. And uh, it was mostly codified by this guy, Zermelo. There's a few other people, so I put a plus plus. Uh, and it's actually very simple in a way. He's like, constant names, don't need them. Function names, don't need them. Relation names, I'm only going to have one. It's called is element of x, y. And it means that x is an element of y. Usually write it like this. And it had uh, nine axioms, which mathematicians casually call z, f, c. The z is for Zermelo, and f is for Frankel, and c is for choice. But anyway, it's some nine axioms. And they say some basic things, like this one says, um, for all x and all y, these are sets, there exists some z such that x is in z and y is in z. Yeah, it's just a set that contains x and y. Okay, it's like a very basic fact. And this says that if two sets have the same elements, then they're the same. Okay, and much like I was saying before with natural numbers, even though this only seems to talk about sets, you can actually use it to build up more advanced concepts. Like you can define natural numbers by sets, and then you can define, you know, integers by natural numbers, and you can define lists in terms of sets, and you can define rational numbers in terms of pairs of integers, you can define real numbers. You can actually build up a whole bunch of mathematics. In fact, based on 100 years of experience, it seems that you can almost uh, formalize and prove any statement at all about mathematics just from these axioms. In fact, every single thing we'll prove in this course, you can prove in principle, just from these uh, nine ZFC axioms. Okay, that's it. Uh, you can get the quizzes.